Two experienced pilots, a familiar airplane, a normal afternoon arrival. There was no mechanical failure reported, no sudden emergency declared, no loss of control in the air. The weather was not considered hazardous. Visibility was good. The runway was dry. There was no reason to expect an abnormal landing. And yet, just seconds after touching down, this Cessna Skylane ran out of runway, lifted back into the air, and struck power lines only a few hundred feet beyond the pavement. So today, we're not looking for a dramatic moment where everything suddenly went wrong. Instead, we're going to slow this accident down and follow it the same way investigators did. One decision at a time, using the information available in the cockpit at each moment. Because the most difficult accidents to understand are often the ones where nothing appears broken, until there's no room left to recover. The aircraft involved was a Cessna 182R Skylane, registration November 7306 Hotel. This is a type of airplane that many pilots trust deeply. It has predictable handling characteristics, good performance margins, and a reputation for being forgiving during landing, provided it is flown within stabilized parameters. At the controls was Dr. Donald L. Waymeyer, age 75. In the right seat was Curtis Grady Robertson, age 64, who was also a pilot-rated occupant. What's important to understand here is not simply that both occupants were experienced, but what that experience likely created in the cockpit. This was not a training flight. It was not an evaluation. There was no indication of time pressure, deteriorating weather, or an aircraft issue that demanded heightened vigilance. From the cockpit perspective, this likely felt like a routine arrival, one that didn't require rethinking fundamental assumptions about the airplane, the runway, or the conditions. And that sense of routine matters more than we often realize. When pilots operate in familiar environments, they tend to rely more on expectations than on active verification. Expectations about where the wind is coming from. Expectations about how the airplane will slow down. Expectations about how much runway will be available after touchdown. The investigation found no evidence of any pre-impact mechanical failures. The engine was producing power. The flight controls were functional. The airplane was capable of a normal landing. So at this stage, there's no failure to point to, no malfunction to explain the outcome. Instead, what we have is a situation where everything appeared normal, and that appearance shaped the decisions that followed. To understand how those decisions unfolded, we now need to look at the environment the airplane was arriving into. The airplane was arriving at a non-towered airport. That means there was no air traffic controller assigning runways, spacing traffic, or intervening when operations became misaligned. At non-towered airports, safety depends heavily on shared expectations. Pilots build a mental picture of the traffic flow by listening to radio calls, observing other aircraft, and reading visual cues like wind socks and pattern activity. On this afternoon, other aircraft in the pattern were operating on runway 17. The accident airplane, however, planned to land on runway 35, the opposite direction. This does not automatically mean a mistake was made. Pilots are allowed to choose runways at non-towered airports. But when an aircraft operates opposite the established flow, the margin for misunderstanding increases. Other pilots attempted to advise the accident aircraft over the radio that runway 17 was in use. Those calls were made on the common traffic advisory frequency. There was no acknowledged response. It's important to be careful here. A lack of response does not mean the calls were ignored. Radios can be busy. Messages can overlap. A pilot may prioritize flying the airplane over replying. But the practical outcome is that the airplane continued toward a runway choice that differed from the rest of the traffic, and possibly from what the wind was actually doing on the field. Why does this matter? Because runway choice is rarely an isolated decision. It's closely tied to wind interpretation, energy management, and landing performance. When an aircraft commits to a runway early, every later decision is built on that foundation. By this point in the flight, nothing had gone wrong. But the system was becoming less forgiving. The airplane was committed to a landing direction. The crew's expectations were aligned with that choice. 
and the accuracy of the information supporting it was about to become critical. In the next section, we'll look at the wind information the pilots were relying on, and why what they believed about the wind may not have matched what the airplane actually encountered. As the airplane continued inbound, the crew had access to automated weather information from the airport's weather observation system. That system indicated winds favoring runway 35. From the cockpit perspective, this likely confirmed their plan. It aligned with the runway they had already chosen and removed any immediate reason to reconsider. At this point, there was no strong incentive to stop, reassess, or change direction. What the crew did not know, because there was no way for them to know in real time, was that the wind information they were receiving was unreliable. During the investigation, examiners found that the wind direction sensing equipment was mechanically misaligned. The installation was incorrect, and the required verification of accurate wind direction during maintenance had not been properly completed. In other words, the system was reporting wind direction, but that direction could not be trusted. At the same time, visual indicators on the airport, specifically the wind socks, were showing a southerly wind. A southerly wind would favor runway 17 and produce a tailwind for runway 35. This creates an important moment to pause and think. When multiple sources of information disagree, automated weather, wind socks, and the runway other pilots are using, what should carry the most weight? From a systems perspective, this is where expectation bias becomes powerful. Once a plan is formed, information that supports it tends to feel more reliable, while conflicting cues are easier to discount or rationalize. This may not sound significant at first, a light tailwind often feels manageable, but tailwinds quietly change the physics of landing in ways that are easy to underestimate. A tailwind increases ground speed. Higher ground speed means more kinetic energy. More energy means more runway required to stop. The airplane doesn't know what the pilot expects. It only responds to physics. And by continuing toward runway 35, the crew was setting themselves up for a landing where energy margins would be smaller than anticipated, without realizing it. As the airplane turned final and continued toward the runway, the most important factor was no longer wind direction or runway choice. It was energy. Energy management is central to every landing, but it often works quietly in the background. Pilots don't think in terms of equations. They think in terms of feel, airspeed, descent rate, sight picture. When those cues drift outside normal ranges, the airplane begins consuming runway and options faster than expected. The Cessna crossed the runway threshold high and fast. That combination matters because height translates into potential energy and speed translates into kinetic energy. Both must be removed before the airplane can stop. In a stabilized approach, that energy is bled off gradually and predictably before the wheels ever touch the ground. Here, that didn't happen. At this moment, the crew still had a clean option available. Do not land. A go-around before touchdown would have reset the situation entirely. Altitude, airflow, and climb performance were still working in their favor. But once the airplane crossed the threshold with excess energy, time began to compress. Touchdown occurred approximately halfway down the usable runway. From that point on, the outcome depended almost entirely on physics, not technique. This is an important distinction. Pilots often think of runway overruns as braking problems. But most overruns begin earlier, at the touchdown point. Every foot of runway used while still airborne is runway that cannot be used for stopping. With only half the runway remaining, the airplane now needed to dissipate all remaining energy in a very short distance. And because ground speed was higher than expected, that energy was greater than anticipated. Witnesses reported wheel smoke, indicating heavy braking. That tells us the crew recognized the urgency of the situation and was attempting to stop the airplane. From inside the cockpit, this likely still felt recoverable. The airplane was on the ground, brakes were responding, the runway was still moving beneath them, but there is a point during any landing where braking alone can no longer solve the problem. That point is invisible. There is no cockpit warning, no enunciator, no clear line on the pavement. Once that point is passed, 
stopping becomes mathematically impossible. This is also where decision-making becomes exceptionally difficult. Humans are very good at continuing actions that appear to be working, and heavy braking does feel like progress, right up until it doesn't. By the time it became clear that the airplane would not stop within the remaining runway, the crew faced a rapidly narrowing set of choices, and none of them were good. As the airplane reached the end of the runway still carrying significant speed, the crew attempted to transition back into flight. This moment deserves careful explanation because late go-arounds are often misunderstood. A go-around is a safe normal maneuver when initiated early, but after a long touchdown and aggressive braking, the airplane is in one of the worst possible energy states for flight. Here's why. The airplane is low, often only a few feet above the surface. It is configured for landing, with flaps extended, increasing drag. The engine is transitioning from idle or partial power to full power, which takes time, and the airplane must first arrest any downward motion before it can climb. Beyond the runway end, the terrain dropped away. The airplane descended briefly, then began to climb again. This sequence is consistent with an aircraft attempting to fly while still shedding landing energy. At this point, the airplane's performance margin was extremely limited. Even with full power, acceleration was slow, climb rate was minimal, and any obstacle ahead became critical. And there was an obstacle. Power lines were located approximately 440 feet beyond the end of the runway. That distance may sound substantial, but at low altitude and modest climb performance, it disappears almost instantly. From the cockpit, this final phase would have unfolded very quickly. There was no time to analyze, no opportunity to reconfigure, no chance to outclimb what lay ahead. The airplane struck the power lines shortly after becoming airborne. This was not a failure of technique, it was a consequence of timing. Once the decision to go around was delayed beyond a certain point, the airplane no longer had the energy, altitude, or performance required to clear obstacles. This is why investigators emphasize early decisions, not perfect ones. The investigation ultimately concluded that the accident resulted from an unstabilized approach and a delayed decision to go around, with misleading wind information as a contributing factor. But it's crucial to understand what that really means. The unstable approach didn't cause the crash by itself, the tailwind didn't cause the crash by itself. The late go-around didn't cause the crash by itself. What caused the crash was how these factors interacted, quietly shrinking margins until there were no safe outcomes left. By the time the airplane left the runway, the accident was already unavoidable. Not because of a single mistake, but because the window for recovery had closed. This accident did not result from a dramatic failure or an obvious error. It resulted from small, ordinary factors aligning in a way that quietly removed safety margins. A runway choice reinforced by faulty information. An approach that drifted outside stabilized parameters. A touchdown point that left little room for correction. And a decision window that closed faster than expected. From the cockpit, each step likely felt reasonable at the time. That's what makes accidents like this so difficult, and so important, to understand. The lesson here is not about blame, it's about awareness. Verifying wind information when cues conflict, recognizing when an approach is no longer stabilized, and making early decisions while options still exist, because in aviation, the most dangerous situations often don't announce themselves loudly. They develop quietly until there's no room left to recover,